Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. My mantra for surviving this career is never give up. And if you feel that it is something that you're compelled to do, you will know that. And if it's not, then don't waste your time and energy because there are too many people that will want it more than you do. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of In the Envelope. I am your host, Jack, awards editor at Backstage. You know the drill. Over at Backstage, we are very much gearing up for the primetime Emmys. The Creative Arts Emmys, which happened the weekend before, just took place. For those desperate to read about Emmy results, head over to Backstage.com and stay tuned there and here on the podcast. Of course, next week, we'll be I'll be kind of reacting to or recapping those Emmys. And frankly, we are already looking far ahead at the Oscars, even though they are in March. We at Backstage already have you covered there as film and festival award season is already underway. But um, today's guest, the voice you just heard, listeners, is that of Richard E. Grant. I'm so excited about this interview, about today's episode. What a charming individual. What an amazing actor. With this storied career of, I guess I can say, character actor roles in a lot of really prominent uh, filmmakers movies, and he's appeared here and there over the years, and he's always fascinating and hilarious and really knows his instrument well, as they say. And listen, this podcast is over four years old. We've asked anyone and everyone about their specific character-building, nitty-gritty acting technique secrets. And so whenever someone has an answer I've never heard before and would never even think of, such as Richard E. Grant did when he spoke about Establishing a character's sex life and then their sense, that really just made me sit up in my chair. I mean, that is just so exciting for those of us who are nerdy about acting craft stuff. Richard E. Grant is fully equipped to address those kinds of things. So stick around for this interview. Stick around for that specific crafty stuff and his very inspirational advice. And I just want to make a note here, too, that this interview took place a couple weeks ago. And since then, we've heard the very sad news that Richard's wife by the name of Joan Washington, who's a dialect coach and performer. She has passed away. Uh, Our hearts go out to Richard. We're so sorry that that is happening right now. Thank you so much to Richard for taking the time to do this interview. It's really a good one. So let's get to it. And those of you who want a fun, glittery movie musical in your life, which we could all use right about now, go check out Everybody's Talking About Jamie. All right, now let's take a quick break and introduce Richard to get to this fabulous interview. Hey, if you are an actor or an aspiring actor, someone at the beginning of your artistic career, and you haven't signed up for Backstage yet and you don't know how it works, I have good news for you. Backstage is offering 30 whole days completely free just for our In the Envelope listeners. If you visit backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope, you will have full access to the site where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start applying to the thousands of casting notices uploaded every single day on the world's number one casting platform. Again, we are giving listeners of this podcast 30 days completely free to try out Backstage. Go to checkout, that's backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope if you want to be in contention for an emmy or for an oscar or for a tony or for a sag award do as many of the guests on this podcast have suggested and use backstage we are here for you again free 30-day trial backstage.com slash subscribe enter the code envelope (laughs) 
Richard E. Grant launched his acting career playing a washed-up, unemployed actor in cult classic With Nail and I, which led to his work with Steve Martin, Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese, and Julian Fellows, plus Spice World, Game of Thrones, Star Wars, and more. Richard wrote and directed the 2005 film Wawa, earned an Oscar nomination for his work in Can You Ever Forgive Me, and recently appeared on the Disney Plus series Loki as Classic Loki, and the Amazon Studios movie musical Everybody's Talking About Jamie. Here is the wonderful Richard E. Grant. How are you? Is this a full day of press? Uh, it's all good. All Is good. it? I haven't had to leave home, so you know that's that's a that's a revolution. It's a nice way to do press, right? Yeah. Oh, Got you. Wonderful, and congratulations on this film uh, finally being out, finally being ready to go. Thank you. <laughs> And so, because we are backstage, we are all about uh, acting. And I'm going to ask you all of your deepest, darkest secrets about the craft and business of acting. Okay, um, I know nothing. <laughs> I know. Well, I know that you uh, you say you know nothing, but yet you are also very good at talking about it. So I'm excited to I'm excited to ask you. Um, I'm excited to ask you, for example, why acting? Take us back to the beginning. You know, were you bit by the acting bug at a young age? Uh, nobody in my family was an actor. And I grew up in what was then called Swaziland till a year ago. It's now called Eswatini, the smallest country in the Southern Hemisphere in Southeast mm -hmm. Africa. And so I had uh, made theatres out of shoeboxes with uh, characters cut out on lollipop sticks and painted mm -hmm. scenery. I did that and made love puppets and, and string puppets and I had a marionette theatre, did amateur plays at school. I'm the theatre club in the town that I grew up in. So when I look back on it, it's a very clear line all the way through. But it seemed, I mean, certainly to my parents and the people that I was at school with, saying that you want to be a professional actor was mm. as ludicrous as saying, you know, you wanted to fly go to the moon, which in 1969 they did when I was 12 years old. I said, you see, they got to the moon. I can try and become an actor. Um, so it was mostly just humoured and... Mm derided and you know not, not really taken very seriously so which sure. is the best preparation you can have because <laughs> um being told told no and having that sort of tattooed invisibly on everybody's head you you, you i think you do in unintentionally um inadvertently develop a kind of F you well i'm i'm gonna have a go at this and yes. if i if i failed then i failed it at least i would have tried rather than living a life of I could have, would have, should have. Yes. Um, which has been my dread. Sure. Well, it's sort of like that. It's there's two schools of thought, right? Like you're supposed to be given hope and hopeful, but also you have to be realistic. Like you knew going into this just how difficult it would be to make a living as an actor, right? Oh, yeah. My, my father said to me, he, he died 40 years ago this, this year. And shortly mm. before he died, he was very young, he was 53. He said to me, um, and I was just starting out as a professional actor. He said, do you really want to spend your life in makeup and tights to earn oh. a living? And you might be destitute. And I said, well, you know, there are very few parts where male actors have to wear makeup and you know, even fewer far between do you have to wear tights. Well, I stand completely corrected because he obviously had a silver ball um, because this year, um, I mean, tights in Loki. And <laughs> I mean, tights in drag, covered in makeup for, you know, Loki Chanel and everybody's talking about James. So, um, except I have earned a good living at it. So, prophetic. Yeah. It has, it's prophetic, but I haven't been destitute, which is his big why. Sure. Well, and so we also, on this podcast, I mean, we're so fascinated by, by, the quote unquote breakout and how seldom it's an overnight success. But in your case with, with Nell and I, I, you just have like the dream actors, actor breakthrough, because not only did you have this big first feature film, but you were playing an unemployed actor. What do you remember about that time? And like, if there are aspiring actor listeners who want to follow your same path, you know, how did you uh, score that? I had been unemployed for nine months, 1985, yes. Yes. and 
uh, Mary Sowell, the late great casting director in England, had, I think they'd been trying for two months. Daniel De Lewis had turned down the role because he had opened simultaneously on, in America, mm. a room of the view, then an Edwardian Esthete and a punk gay rocker in My Beautiful Old Dread. Mm. So his career just exploded and he, mercifully for me, he chose to do the unbearable likeness of being instead. Ah. So I think they'd, you know, they, between the casting director and the writer director, Bruce Robinson, they didn't. They hadn't found anybody that they thought was right for this part. Um, and then they got hold of me because I'd appeared in one television improvised, improvised film with Honest ah. Decent and True with Gary Oldman. Mm -hmm. And that had come out in January on the BBC. And Mary Selwood had seen that and said, you should get this guy. And he looks peculiar. I think he is peculiar. Um, and audition him. So I did. And then they put me through two weeks of auditions where I went in every day and I was reading, reading, reading. And I assumed oh, okay. that this was because they had the person who was playing my part and they were just using me as a guinea pig to test other actors who were playing the I part. Oh, really? And she okay. said, oh, you, you, you've got this part. <laughs> and the actor, Michael Maloney, an English actor who'd been cast on the same day as I was to play the other, the other part, um, mm -hmm. Marwood, he's never mentioned by name in the script, the I in the um, title. Um, we got to Notting Hill tube station after we'd been both been told that we got these parts and they were going to mm. call our agents that evening. And Michael said that he thought that the film was possibly anti-gay, anti-black, anti-Irish, and <laughs> he didn't think that he wanted to do it. And I said, so, yeah. we spent all this time auditioning together because they wanted a pair of people that, that had a natural chemistry. Mm. Don't mean that I won't, I won't be able to do it now. And I was absolutely distraught. And I got home and it was then confirmed by my agent that I had got this part and that I had to go back in again the next day to audition with Paul McGann, who'd been one of the people that auditioned for it right at the beginning. So it was oh, okay. a very complicated thing. Anyway, but when the movie came out, it was... It came out in very few um, cinemas or movie theaters and got very mediocre reviews for the most part. So okay. it was, its success was a very, very slow, long, mm. slow burn because mm. it was only through video and then subsequently DVD and students, certainly in England, watching it that gave it this ongoing, you know, minute bubble of cult success. Mm. So it never felt like an overnight thing at all. <laughs> Sure. And a great launch of a career and on film and has subsequently led to almost every other part that I've got. So the irony of having right. been an unemployed actor, I've been, <laughs> it's led to all my subsequent employment. So, you know, my, my, my mantra for surviving this career is never give up. Hmm. And if you feel that it is something that you're compelled to do, you will know that. And if it's not, then don't waste your time and energy because there are too many people that will want it more than you do. So yeah, that's all I would say. That is pure gold advice. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I know that there, the fans over time came out of the woodwork Winona Ryder and Johnny Depp were, were fans of the film and people, famous directors that you would never dream with. They referenced with Neil and I, when they ended up casting you, correct? Yeah. They really, every opportunity really did come from this very, as you say, slow burn. Yeah. Like hit. I, I can remember going to a party in LA in pro probably 1992 or 1993, you know, six or seven years after the movie had been out. And uh, I met Robin Williams at the same time as Sean Penn. You, you couldn't <laughs> find two more disparate personas or personalities on screen, at least. Um, mm. To my knowledge, they never worked together, but they were at this party together. And both of them didn't know my name, but they said, uh, with now. No way. So that was, that was a weird thing. And then Robert Williams told me that he is, he was a recovering drug and alcohol addict and yeah, he knew lines from the movie. So that was, that was utterly surreal to have that because you know, I so admired him and I thought he was so hilarious. So to have him corner me at a party and just start doing this stuff, I thought, God, how's this happened? 
That is fascinating that they didn't know your name. It says so much about, um, I almost want to ask about branding and, and reputation. And you mentioned that the casting director said that you looked funny and sound funny. And I know that for everybody who loves Jamie, this director wanted to, wanted to cast you because you have quote sad eyes. And I'm wondering, oh. do you have a, do you, as an actor, have you always been thinking about your quote unquote type? Or is that something that you've had to, to kind of weigh? I can, I have skills in this. I can provide this, not so much this. Um, I think that's, that there were two people that I was absolutely inspired by when, when I was a teenager. Um, the first was Donald Sutherland because I'd seen mm -hmm. him, I'd seen him in movies in 1969, Kelly's Heroes and MASH in 1970. Um, and then Clute subsequently. And because he was very tall, very thin, and had a very long face, I thought, well, he's, he's made as an actor. And she yes. also came from, you know, St. John's in, um, in Canada, which I've subsequently worked in. And it's, you know, it's tiny. It's like where I grew up. Um, same, you know, small, small town kind of mentality. Mm. Um, I thought, well, if he can, you know, he can do it. And then, of course, I saw... Uh, funny girl when I was 12 and there was a person who was constantly her character was constantly being told you can't do this you can't do that because you don't look right you don't look this and you know, Streisand has a very long face as well so I thought well mm. the combination of these two people these are two talents that are worth you know being inspired by and I've remained inspired by them all my life and have followed their careers and mm. have met both of them mm -hmm. um, so I also got an assessment in my final year of uh, drama school where this professor got me in and said, you know, I think that you have real talent as a writer director and that is where your future will lie, but mm. you are too peculiar looking, lantern jawed and lightweight mm. to probably succeed and have an acting career. So, you know, when you're 22 years old and you're told that, it's very hard not to think that, well, this person, you know, is looking to the crystal ball. You know, the Wizard mm -hmm. of Oz can see, see everything and know everything. So I suppose every role that I've had since, and certainly the movie breaks that I've had over the last 40 years, there's a kind of fuck you moment to that of going, well, yeah. you know, I've, I've proved him wrong. So again, it's the same thing, never give up. Yeah. That's somehow if you keep... If you keep at it, you end up like old Dobbin the donkey. You finally get the carrot at the end. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Yeah, well, and in your, um, you interviewed Max Harwood for Backstage Magazine last year, and you said this great quote where you apparently told him, we're not doing heart surgery here. We are telling stories, so we have to find fun in it. Yeah. You also take, you, it sounds like you take this all very seriously, but also not. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's a great Oscar Wilde quote. I don't know what it is that you know you things that are frivolous you you take very seriously, and things that are mm. very serious you treat with frivolity. What, what, however, it's put, but that's in essence what what it is that you know. I don't you know I love what I do, and I love going to see actors. And you know, whenever I'm in New York or in London, I would go and see every single play mm. that I can possibly you know get tickets for, um, that appetite has never ceased or gone away because, I mean, the level of talent is astonishing. And mm. the young talent that is out there is, you know, just breathtaking to me. So that hasn't changed at all. And I think that, what is your question? Why have I gone off on this? <laughs> I mean, what is your advice to those early career actors? I don't think you can give anybody any advice. Sure, I sure. I don't, I don't think you can teach people to act either. Mm -hmm. You know, you can give them mm -hmm. technique of you know, how to breathe or project their voices or not that you need to know with microphones. And, um, oh. But I think that you know, just doing it, that's, that's, the, that's the crack of it. Um, and why you do it, I, I have no idea. And I don't know how people do it. Um, when I see people give performances, it just it takes my breath away. But how they do that, and if somebody says to me, how did you do that? I have no idea. Mm. I don't know. I don't know what it is. 
it's it's a mystery to me. Sure. What's your technique, or how did you get into that? I don't know. You read the lines, and you know what comes into your head and out of your heart. And <laughs> as, as you you said, this director, everybody's talking about Jamie, said that I have sad eyes. You know, I yeah. don't walk around looking in a mirror thinking, "My God, do I have sad eyes?" <laughs> don't, don't, don't see the world through sad eyes. Right. You're not. Um targeting and auditioning for the sad eyes roles on purpose <laughs> not that i'm aware of there's not a lot of strategy oh, it's you know it's you're taught for hire and it's how other people <laughs> see you you know somebody sees jack smart and they go well you know you could be you could be marco polo um you sure could be whatever <laughs> because it's how somebody perceives you and you have no control over that sure and that's that is the kick of it that you have you have no idea. I think what you were talking about is branding. That, mm. that certainly I knew, to go back to your earlier question, that because of my physiognomy mm. um, and that if I don't smile, I look, I've had people come up to me in the street and go, are you all right? And I go, yeah, why? Oh. You're great. And they go, oh, you look miserable. Because <laughs> as you smile, you have a long face. It's long face syndrome. You know, it's a, it's a phenomenon. Um, and inevitably, having the, the first movie role that I played was such an extreme character, you know, a mm. raging alcoholic, egotist, very selfish and very outspoken, that I suppose has meant that shy and retiring um, mm. people who maybe live next door um, <laughs> are not the kind of roles that, that I've been assigned to in my life. So mm. I'm not complaining. It's just I think that set the kind of marker for oh well this guy is either manic or extreme or whatever yeah. you said. and i'm trying to be analytical I'm not not really doing <laughs> it very well. no yes it's wonderful well and i this might be more of a side note but i have i have to ask i think you might be one of the greatest drunk actors of all oh. time and i mean obviously with nail onward um can you forgive me indeed like are there secrets to playing drunk you also have an alcohol intolerance, correct me if I'm wrong? Yeah, I have no enzyme in my system, so I can't drink. I literally have the most violent allergic reaction to it. Yeah. But um, ironically, my, my father was an alcoholic, and mm. so I was around that on a daily basis. So and I can, I, the thing that most struck me about his behavior, and I've seen in other people, is that drunks do everything to conceal the fact that they're drunk. So you, know, mm. you don't get all that. They do so that everything's just on that slight delay that, ah. um, that they seem, seem, seem to have. So if they're trying to walk down <laughs> the line in the middle of the road, that requires a huge amount of concentration. <laughs> so that seemed to me the key to it. Wow. What do I know? I know nothing. <laughs> Well, and that goes off Where's of the, the tech. other person? Where's the other person that I saw a screenshot of? Oh, Jamie is here. Yes. <laughs> Jamie's here Jamie. to make sure that we sound all right. Yes. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm just watching from the distance. I, I only did that to see if Jamie was fast asleep because it's like, like this. In the middle of the press day. I'm yeah. Still I'm, here I'm still here. <laughs> That's good. This also feels very, it feels, everybody's talking about Jamie and here's Jamie and you have a perfume named Jack and here's Jack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. Um, going off of the technique thing. I mean, uh, are there things that you do every time? I mean, you mentioned you read the script and you, you kind of respond to it, but is there uh, from the drama school days, are there acting techniques that you find yourself using every time? Uh, there are two things that's, I don't know if they're particularly drama school, but or Stanislavski, but the, the, the first thing I am always concerned about is what is the sex life of the character? And it's the same thing that when I meet anybody in real life, really? I wonder what kind of sex they have. Because I think that that is the key to everything about everybody. Because it's the part that is either the most concealed ah. or the most obvious, but to me, how somebody fuck somebody else or wants to is going to guide their most primal behavior. Wow. So I think that's, I, I find that absolutely riveting. Um, and also what 
be what scent they would have, like an animal. What oh, I also think of them are what kind of animal they would be. And I think of all my friends in terms of what animals they are um, and what <laughs> scent they have. So that and yeah, the scent and their sex life. Wow. You know, they're they're, they're to, the, to me the keys to, to what people do. I've never, I've never ever heard that. And I've heard, heard a lot of answers to the technique question and I've never heard the, how detailed do you go? Are you creating backstories that involve yeah. their sex lives? Yeah, completely. Really? Yeah. This is for if every you, character. If you, meet, if you meet somebody and you think there's something here that's, that's not apparent mm. or that's hidden or whatever, it's either a lack of sex or wanting that kind of sex or this kind of sex or not having enough or whatever it is or having too much or being only obsessed with that. So I think that's, I think that's the key. Their sex life and not, and not just like, so not just their sexuality, but, but how, how much they're doing it and how much access they have to it and how much they want it is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You know, I don't think it's rocket science to work out what Hugo <laughs> Battersea's sex life is living in that drag shop alone. You know, there's, uh, probably, yeah. there's probably a lot of old video porn lying around. Sure. And I, I bet that's also sense must be, for this movie, sense must be very important, I think, for drag, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You've got to you've got to look good and smell good. Yeah, um, I'm so fascinated by the kind of the inspirations that went into this character and the kind of research that you did. Is it true that you watched every season possible of RuPaul's Drag Race? Yeah, I'd never seen drag before. Yeah, and, um, Jonathan Butler put me in contact with an avant-garde drag artist in England called David Hoyle, who's mm-hmm. the same age as me, and he's from the north of England, and. I went to see him perform and the bravery stroke vulnerability of what mm. emanated from him was so, made such an indelible impression. I thought if I can do anything at all, any justice to this character, mm. um, he was a great role model for that. And the other thing that I was so struck by, I thought, well, you, you can't go half measure if you're playing somebody who is a drag queen, who is mm. in real life, not in the drag, but all the gestures and the mannerisms. I thought, oh God, am I going to insult people by, mm. by being, I suppose the best way of putting it is just straight out camping. Um, mm. And then, but David Hoyle is like that in real life. Mm. And then I watched 11 seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race in three weeks, <laughs> which wow. is, that's a lot. That's a big yeah. And when I saw how, what shade those people threw at each other and how vulnerable they were, stroke bitchy and mm. the, the resistance that they had to fight, prejudice in their own families and in society and from each other, mm. I thought this, this is a, a real vulnerable toughness combination that is yeah. almost unlike anything else I'd ever encountered. So, um, and also the kind of sex that they either want to have or don't have, that permeates everything as well. There you so, go. Yeah. Um, that, that was really the inspiration for this. Yeah. Well, and it, drag is acting essentially, right? I mean, is drag a metaphor for acting? Like you mentioned the vulnerability, the strength, it's creating an alter ego. I mean, in this role, did you feel like you were playing two different characters in and out of drag? Yeah, because I was playing the, the complete has been downtrodden, um, you know, life passed him by um, character was, it, it, that was very clear and straightforward in, um, mm-hmm. in a sense. But um, it's only until, have you ever been in drag? Um, no, I mean, only kind of living room drag, very casual. Yeah, but you've done that. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't done. I haven't done casual living room drag. <laughs> um, yeah, you've done movie but, star drag. But you will understand that it is when you've got all that thing on. It is like an armor. Yeah, I was six foot eight with this huge Margaret Thatcher like wig and this <laughs> double D brassiere, you know, huge heels. You feel mm. kind of that you can sass and you know sashay around with the best of them. So something something does happen to you. And Jonathan Buttles said to me. You know, your inner drag queen will come out no matter what. And I was—I lived in terror of that. I thought, well, 
he keeps saying that that's going to happen, but I didn't really believe that it would. But once once you're in that, and you, the people give you the confidence to do that, and this incredible makeup that Guy Common created, and Guy Speranza, this amazing outfit, then, yeah, okay, I'll go for it. Because you have to. You can't yeah. be... You can't take it at half measure. And that was so clear from RuPaul's Drag Race, mm. that if people were very frightened or tearful or falling apart backstage, when they got on stage, it was like, va va boom you know, yeah. I thought, well, that's, that's what you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think the movie does a great job of conveying commitment is important in performance and like, and faking it, right. If you need to fake yeah. it, yeah. it's all fake. It's all camp. Like, yeah. yeah. Also about this, this role, you, you are natural in terms of movie musicals. You spoke about the Streisand reference. <laughs> Don't make a face. You really seem to have like a natural musical theater actor sensibility. Does that come from stu studying musical films? Does it come from worshiping Barbara? Jack, this comes from <laughs> flattered that you can blow this smoke my way. But I <laughs> literally, I Sean Niles, who's a choreographer dancer in Kylie Minogue's um, touring troupe. Um, and he's taught many catwalk models how to walk in those vertiginous heels. Oh, yeah. I trained with him a lot just to get the confidence into how to walk around and throw these moves and things. Um, not that I was ever asked to do very much of that in the movie, but it certainly instilled a sense of what sass it takes to do that. Mm. And then I had a wonderful singing teacher called Anne Marie Speed who gave me the confidence to you know try and sing. So that really is is, you know, what it came from. I relied entirely on the team of people who sort of put me together and said, you know, you can do this. I felt like mm. one of those old sort of vintage Ferrari coming to a pit stop on, in Monaco on the, you know, race <laughs> track where, you know, in 60 seconds flat, they change the tires, they change the clothes, they change the steering wheels and everything, and boom, then it's off down the motorway again. <laughs> Except that mine wasn't in 60 seconds. It took about two months of trial and error and very sure. few, the endlessly, when at one point I was I was wearing wigs that were like Liza Minnelli and Cabaret that sort of very tight fit and I thought oh god no I can't I just look exactly like me with a bad wig on oh so okay it was only when we got this sort of huge Thatcherite wig on that I thought <laughs> okay that looks different to what I feel like inside so it's confidence you know that's what it comes down to and that team of people that Jonathan created around me and putting me in touch with the drag artist David Hoyle gave me the sort of background and confidence to to make it have a stab at it put it that way yes the trial and error and that again is so what acting is right it's trial and error it's 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 finding the right I don't know finessing we also on this podcast it's we've talked a lot about outside in versus inside out and it seems like drag or particularly getting into drag for this character is inherently there are outside in clues. Yeah. 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 Being six, then, eight, as you say, dictates the character. Yeah. And you suddenly yeah. walk into a room and you have to bend to get through the door mm. and crew members that are now at your fake nipple level. Um, <laughs> it may be seemed intimidating standing around <laughs> in wife beater outfits because it was shot in the summer two years ago. When right. you're in this full drag, their reaction to you, <laughs> that informs you as well because you. They, they treat you differently. Mm. You've got heels that could kick somebody's ass and you get a bit <laughs> of sass going within the cinched in waist. It's <laughs> an extraordinary sort of thing happens that it's not only you who feel transformed, but it's how other people react to you that... Mm. So, and somehow the combination of the two, you meet halfway through. I don't know. Right. And that's important for actors too, is to, you can't perform it in a bubble necessarily. You do have to have the audience perceptions of you inform you. Yeah. Or maybe it goes back to the sad eyes thing. You do have to know that you have sad eyes in order to work with that. <laughs> well, I've never been told I had sad eyes before Jonathan Buttrell. You know, I've been doing this for four <laughs> decades, but you know, I'm now a sad eye grant. Yeah. It, something clicked for you. Oh, this makes sense now. Yeah. Well, so we have to, I have to ask you for all, all of the advice um, that, you know, the early career actors listening to this, we ask a lot about auditions. Do you have like an audition philosophy? Oh yes, have I you... do. I know that everybody 
now for TV and movies, you audition virtually on self-taping. Mm. Um, and I know actors of my generation who balk at self-taping, and but my feeling is that you have the opportunity to retake and send the best of yourself. The nerves of having to do it, walk in with 10 other people waiting or 50 other people waiting, that is taken out of the equation. So I think that it's a great advantage. Of course, it's not the same as when you are physically in a room with somebody, but mm. it, it affords you as an actor some sense of control that you think, well, if they don't like me or they don't think I'm right for it, it's, it's something that is sent separately. Whereas if you walk into a room and they just go, hmm, Jack, mm, no, no, sorry, we don't want somebody with a beard, and you're out the door before. Whereas if you know yeah. in advance, they don't want somebody with a beard, and you're only going to shoot from there upwards because you're doing a show where you need a beard, you know, there are, <laughs> there are ways that you can, you can accommodate that. Yeah. But I met Donald Sutherland. My wife is an accent coach. She was coaching him on dry white season in the 90s. And I met him at, the, at a hotel in, in LA and she was coaching him. And I said, Mr. Sutherland, I said, call me Donald. I said, okay, um, at what point in your career do you stop auditioning? And he wagged a finger at me and he said, you've got this back to front. He said, don't think like that. Mm. He said, I always audition and I always want to audition. But he said, because it gives you the opportunity at that point, you know, pre self taping mm. to audition the people that you're working with to see if you want to work with them. Oh. So he said, if that is in your head, you think, are these people that I would like to spend however much time with? Um, mm. And if they're asking you to do something different that is other than what you thought the role was or how it was prepared, you have to be open to that and accommodate it because that's what they're testing. And then, you know, I know from having cast my own movie, mm -hmm. the decision that is made about casting somebody, you don't need 10 pages of dialogue. You know within nanoseconds mm. whether somebody's right. It's, a, it's equivalent to falling in love or buying an apartment, a house, a car, or whatever. You make those big decisions very, very quickly. And you know if somebody's right, you know, okay, Jack's smart. Has he got this look for this? Does he match what I'm looking for in this character? Or has he brought something that I never thought about that character? Mm. So I think that, that believing that you have to get to a point where you don't have to audition anymore mm. is the day that you, you, you're pulling the lid down on your own career and you know tightening the bolts yeah then you're not open to stuff anymore so as painful as they are to do and i think auditions are sometimes humiliating and soul destroying but for a lot of the time it's it's the one time where you can go in and 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 do a reading or something and for instance i i played tennis with another actor um and he jokingly he was talking he said oh i went up in this bloody thing and they wanted me to shout. And I thought, God, I know what he's talking about. And it was the Star Wars audition where oh. this interrogation scene said, he shouts. And I asked this actor, I said, so what did you do? And he said, well, I shouted through the whole thing. And he said, of course, I'm never gonna get it. And <laughs> I did the opposite. I didn't know this, um, but I instinctively thought with an interrogation scene, if you are, once you're shouting at anything, at a dog or whatever, at another person, mm. you have lost control. Mm. And the one thing an interrogator does have is control. Mm. So I thought it should be almost whispered. So I asked him a few more details about what the lines that he'd had, and he told me, and I realized that I had auditioned for the exact same part. Ah. And I'd done the opposite of what the script had said to do, which was you know, to shout at me like that. And so I ended up getting the part. My point ah. being that everybody wants to know, every director, it seems, or writer wants to know if you are adaptable mm. or open to what they are bringing. Yeah. So that you're not saying, well, you know, I've done this, you know. And people always bring up that famous story about Shelley Winters saying when she was asked to audition in the late 50s and she said, took her Oscar out of her handbag and said, well, some people think I can act. Mm. It's, that's... I understand where that comes from, and it's a great anecdote, but mm. 
I think it misses the point that what a director writer wants to see is if you are right for their project. Yeah. And in fact, you're wiping the slate clean of everything else that you've done before. Yes. So that's my philosophy, which is a very long winded way of saying, absolutely yeah, do it, have no shame. Absolutely. And the more challenging, the more you're going to learn, I feel like. Yeah. Um, do you have a worst audition horror story? Uh, I went up for a musical that an English um, composer called Alan Price had done based on an um, English cartoon called Andy Cap. And he asked me when I went in, he was in a very bad mood because he just got a parking ticket outside the oh. um, and, and I was probably the last person of the day that he came in and um, he said, where's your sheet music? And I didn't have any because I was so naive. I'd never been up for a musical audition before. I didn't realize that you had to have a song prepared and all of that. So he ah. said, well, what have you got? I said, well, I could sing the Swaziland National Anthem. Okay. He said, you know, fucking Swaziland National Anthem. And I said, well, that's what I can sing without <laughs> piano accompaniment. So he said, okay. So I started singing it in Siswati, which is the language that you know, I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And I think I'd got about half a verse in and he said oh shut up and just f off oh my gosh <laughs> but you know he had a right to do that he had a parking parking ticket you know he had some bloody young actor coming in there who wasn't prepared didn't have a song ready didn't have sheet music to give the pianist you know i learned fast you learned there you go yeah um, thank you so much, Richard. This is also great. I, we always ask this. This is one last question. Okay. Um, what is one performance you think every actor should see and why? Maybe it's something you've seen recently. Uh, Al Pacino in the mm. Godfather trilogy mm. Mm. is astonishing. The, the, the journey that that character goes through um, yeah. is absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, just, yeah. Part and parcel of the fact that the movies are so amazing in themselves. What's the most common thing that you get that, that people say for that? <laughs> after that, um, I, I, we hear a lot of Daniel Day Lewis. Um, in 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 many in My Left oh. Foot or in um, There Will Be Blood, but uh -huh. um, we hear a lot of Meryl Streep, of course. Yeah. And then I think Jenna Rollins in Woman Under the Influence is is possibly the most cited one performance, I think, yeah. but, um, yeah. And Pacino has, has, has been mentioned too. Although I don't know if it's in the Godfather, but I think you're right that it's about the three films and the arc that he charts. It's an astonishing, yeah. he covers so much material. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of career, the uh, Meryl Streep is standalone. There's, there's nobody that has done what <laughs> she has done. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> she, she is obligated to come up in every episode of this podcast. So thank you. Yes. Good. <laughs> Good. Thank you, yes. Jeff. Thank you so much, Richard. This is lovely. And um, congratulations on the film. Thank you very much. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.